everyone. <clears throat> so I remember the first time that I was looking for microplastics in the field with my students. We were right here in Washington, DC, down at Fletcher's Cove on the Potomac River. And my students were wearing boots, and they were wading out into the water. They were collecting water and sediment samples in glass jars. Then they took them back to the lab where they analyzed them. They filtered the water, they sieved the sediment, and they looked at the samples under microscopes. Then they counted what they found, and we were shocked. Because we found microplastics and microfibers in every sample that we collected. This was an undergraduate environmental science class, and microplastics were just an interesting topic for them to investigate. Today, my colleagues and I have multiple microplastic research studies going on around tributaries to the Chesapeake Bay. And whether we're looking at water or sediment or fish or other organisms, we find microplastics. Plastic's only been around for just over 100 years. People started to see an increase in deposition around 1945. But over the past 40 years, plastic production has quadrupled. And so has our reliance on single-use plastics, a major contributor to microplastics in the environment. So what are microplastics? Well, they're essentially small or even tiny fragments or pieces of plastic. Most of them come from larger plastics that get broken up in the environment, either from sunlight or chemicals or movement against rocks and other things in the environment. The definition of microplastic is any plastic that's smaller than five millimeters in size. That's about the size of a pencil eraser. So even though microplastics are so small, they've been shown to be the major component of plastic pollution in the environment. It's hard to believe that just a few years ago, microplastics weren't talked about very much. Of course, we knew they existed, and there was research going on about them. But they weren't covered by the mainstream media, and if you ask someone walking down the street what they wear, most people would have no idea. But we're all being exposed to these pollutants. When microplastics exist in the environment, they can be eaten by organisms. And then they can make their way up the food chain that way. One study found microplastics in 85% of fish that were collected. They've also been found in other organisms, like oysters and clams and mussels. And they've been found in other things that we eat regularly, too, like salt and sugar, tea bags, meat, alcohol, bottled water, and tap water. Microplastics have been found the farthest reaches of the Earth, from the tops of the Pyrenees Mountains to the bottom of the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean and in Arctic snow. A recent study found nanoplastics, which are even smaller than microplastics, in ice samples collected in Greenland and Antarctica. And the most surprising finding of that study was that the plastics had been there for decades. So we know that microplastics exist in the environment, and we know that organisms and humans are being exposed. So that leads us to wonder, how did they get there and why? Years ago, when I first started looking at microplastics, most of the research was focused on marine environments and organisms. Today, we know that microplastics largely come from the land and from us. It makes sense to focus on oceans because virtually all plastic that originates on land eventually makes its way to the oceans, the ultimate downstream sink. The way that it gets there is from runoff from land into streams and creeks to rivers and estuaries and eventually to the oceans. About 92% of all plastic at the ocean surface is microplastic, not larger plastics as people often envision. And most of that plastic is either polypropylene, like the plastic that's found in snack and food containers, or polyethylene, like the plastic in plastic grocery bags. And both of those types of plastics were found in those ice samples in Greenland and Antarctica. As well as another type of plastic, too, called polyethylene terephthalate, or PET which likely came from plastic water bottles and soda bottles. Or maybe from the clothes that we wear. 
because we seldom think about where our clothes come from and what they're made of, but the reality is that many of the textiles that our clothes are made of are synthetic and derived from petroleum. This includes things like polyester, rayon, nylon, and acrylic. And when we wear these clothes, like our fleece, they shed microfibers into the environment. And when we wash these clothes, they shed microfibers into the water. The water then goes to wastewater treatment plants where it gets filtered and then released back out into local waterways, usually still containing microfibers and other microplastics. We also know that microplastics can be released from everyday products that we use, like our coffee mugs and baby bottles, our food containers, and they're also shed from our car tires as we drive on roadways. So why should we care? In 2019, the World Health Organization reported that microplastics were ubiquitous in the environment and that there was evidence that exposure to nano and microplastics was a cause for concern for human health. Harm might come from some of the chemicals that are added to the plastics during the production process. This includes things like bisphenol A or BPA, which is added to some plastics to make them stronger and more resistant to high temperatures or phthalates, which is added to other plastics to make them more pliable and flexible. And while both of these and other chemicals are added to the plastics for a reason, many of them have been shown to have toxic properties. Both BPA and phthalates have been shown to have endocrine disrupting effects. That means that they can mess up the hormone systems of organisms, including humans. Harm might also come from some of the chemicals that plastics pick up along the way in the environment things like pesticides and flame retardants. These chemicals have the ability to adsorb or kind of stick onto the plastics as they move through the environment and be carried along that way. We know that most exposure for humans to microplastics comes from ingestion of food and water sources. Last year, a study came out that showed that microplastics were able to cross the human intestinal barrier and another study showed there that they were present in human placentas. Just last month, research demonstrated that polymers from plastics were detected and quantified in human blood collected from the general population. Microplastics also have the ability to be transported long distances, in the air, in the wind, and then be redeposited to the Earth's surface through rain and snow. That means that they could land on our farmland, or in our waterways, or even in our backyards. Microfibers, in particular, have the ability to easily become airborne and can lead to inhalation exposure that way. Just this month, a study showed that microplastics were present in the deepest reaches of human lungs. Scientists estimate that humans are exposed to somewhere between 74,000 and 121,000 microplastic particles every year, either through ingestion or inhalation. So we know that microplastics can potentially cause respiratory issues if they're inhaled, or digestive issues if they're eaten. But there's still a number of questions that exist about other health effects that might result from exposure to microplastics. Many of these are being investigated now. When we think about all of the different types of plastics. There's room for investigating lots of different things that are going on. Microplastics and plastics in particular can have a number of different kinds of environmental injustice issues associated with them too, when we think about the environmental and the health consequences of them, and the ranging from manufacturing processes, to plastic waste, to contributions to climate change. We know that plastic has a really strong tie to climate change, with over 98% of plastic being derived from fossil fuels. Most plastic comes from petroleum, and recently many of the industries have started to turn to using natural gas liquids as a source for plastic production. Plastic production itself is extremely energy intensive, and plastic waste also contributes to carbon emissions. A recent study found that if the global plastic life cycle 
was a country, it would be the fifth largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. People often think that the solution to the plastic problem is recycling. A recent OECD study found that, looking at the global plastic life cycle, prior to our current pandemic, only 9% of plastic waste was actually recycled into new products. That means that the other 91% either ended up in landfills, was incinerated, or moved through the environment. Recycling is simply not possible for all of the variations of plastic that we have, the composite materials, and the sheer volume that we produce. Two recent studies, one from the National Academy of Sciences and another from researchers at Pew Charitable Trust, found that multiple strategies will be necessary in order to combat the plastics problem. But the single largest and perhaps easiest solution is to stop using plastic in single-use items. For something that we use once or for such a short period of time to be made out of a material that sticks around in the environment, breaks up into microplastics, and potentially causes so much harm makes absolutely no sense. For most of human history, we existed without single-use plastics. But today, half of all plastic produced is intended for single-use purposes. We need to move away from producing plastic, which makes more microplastics. And that can start with eliminating single-use plastics from our lives. The UN Environment Assembly meeting just last month was a step in the right direction. And change needs to come from every level. Individuals often think that their own actions don't matter as much because they're just one person. But that's simply not true. Because we all contribute to the microplastic problem. And we can all contribute to the solution. The choices we make, how we choose to spend our money and the items we purchase and use, who we talk to about those choices, and how we speak up all matter. We need to think about the life cycle of plastic. We need to work towards creating and using products that are made to last, or at least be folded back into the manufacturing process when they're at the end of their intended lifespan. I firmly believe that this situation is not hopeless. I have never felt hopeless. My greatest hope is in education, and that's why I teach. I teach undergraduate and, and, uh, and graduate students. I teach community and outreach groups that want to learn about plastics. I work with students that want to research microplastics. I also teach high school teachers in the region about microplastics. And my colleagues and I have developed curriculum that high school teachers and their students can use in order to investigate how microplastics are interacting with tiny organisms in the Chesapeake Bay. Sharing what we know and explaining why people should care about microplastics is important. We need to reframe our thoughts about plastics. We need to rethink what we really need and be more intentional when it comes to plastic. There is hope in what we do and what we say and the actions that we take that can affect change. We can all be that change. Thank you. Thank you.